Hello to our friends joining us via recording. We are working on the lab lesson related to the spinal cord and the bones and muscles of the back. To get us started, we are um, working on identifying how some of the structures in the spinal cord, we don't actually have to memorize them as much as use information in their name to help us figure out where they are. So when we're looking at the spinal cord, Right now we're looking at, at a picture that most closely matches our model on page four in your lab packet. This shows us the spinal cord in the middle of our vertebrae or one of our vertebrae here. Uh, I'll just give us a, a couple of teasers for when we're talking about or studying bones. This particular vertebra, this bone that we see around our spinal cord here, this one is called a cervical vertebra. Cervical vertebra. Now, we learned about the vertebrae in general as the bones that make up the spine. If this one is a cervical vertebra, what does that, that cervical word mean? Does anyone remember? Yeah, so cervical was the word that we used to describe the neck. This is a cervical vertebra, meaning that it's found in the neck region. When we're talking about the vertebrae in the spine, uh, the cervical vertebrae are the eight top vertebrae, the ones at the very top. Here's some ways that, that we identify them with some things actually that you're labeling on this model on page four. The first way that you're always going to be able to identify a cervical vertebra in particular is this structure here in the back or here on the posterior side. This structure back here is called a bifid spinous process. A bifid spinous process. And I know I heard at least one of my groups talking about this. All of, of my vertebrae have a spinous process. A spinous process is just literally something that sticks out. When you feel down your spine, the bony part that you're feeling is the spinous process. When we're talking about the cervical vertebrae, their spinous process is called bifid. What bifid means is that there's two branches to it. So a bifid spinous process, just like a bicycle has two parts or two wheels, a bifid spinous process is one that we see two branches on, as opposed to when we start looking at the other ones, it all just being one bony landmark. So when you look at, at a vertebra on, on the homework assignment or on the exam, if you see two parts to its spinous process, that's called a bifid spinous process. It's got branches on it. Cervical vertebrae are the only kind of vertebrae that have this bifid spinous process. Yeah, and, and so Gloria asks when we talk about spinous processes, they're always found on the dorsal side or on the back side. Yes, that's correct. Because this is the part that, like I said, you feel when you're feeling your spine. I know it's a little funky to think about this being the front. Imagine though that if I'm standing in front of you and you stare straight through me, what you would see first is this part of my bones, the part where my, my vertebral column is resting on that makes it hard. And this would be the part that you would see last on the back side of me because that's the part that sticks out behind me. So always when we're looking at a model that shows the spinal cord inside a vertebra, whether it's a cervical vertebra with this bifid spinous process, or whether it's a thoracic or lumbar vertebra with just a regular spinous process, the spinous process is always on the back side, or it's always on the posterior side. So again, this one is a cervical vertebra. What makes it cervical, the first thing, is the fact that we have uh, this bifid spinous process with two parts. The other thing that helps me to know this is a cervical vertebra are these two things right here. Here's one of them, and here's the other one of them. This is a hole. What was my anatomy word for holes? What bone 
tone marking word always means a whole. Any guesses? Yeah, so the, the bone marking word we're looking for here is foramen. Remember in the bottom of the skull, we had the foramen magnum. So these two things that we see right here are called vertebral foramen. Vertebral foramen, there's two of them. Draw a little line here. Or excuse me, they're not vertebral foramen. I apologize. Um, these particular ones, scratch that. These particular ones are called transverse foramen. Transverse foramen. Um, yeah, and Jacqueline is 100% right. In your picture, rather than just seeing an open space, you actually see some blood vessels inside of here. So let me draw you a couple little ugly blood vessels here. Uh, these, and again, I apologize, they're called the transverse foramen. You may not actually have to label them on this picture. Uh, but my transverse foramen, or transverse foramina, when there's two of them, are holes for blood vessels. In particular, blood vessels you're gonna learn in AMP2 called the carotid arteries. The carotid arteries send blood up to the brain. I only see the carotid arteries traveling inside these transverse foramen when I'm in the neck region, when I'm in the cervical region. None of my other types of vertebrae are going to have these holes for those carotid arteries, because the carotid arteries shoot straight up through the neck into the brain. I don't need them in the chest region. I don't need them in the lower back. So if you look at a vertebra and it has a bifid spinous process, two branches back here, and it has these two big holes or these two spaces with blood vessels inside of them, like we see on our model. Those are the two things you know that always tell you this is a cervical vertebra. So I'm looking at my spinal cord in the neck region. I can see the spinal cord on the inside. I can see the bony structures around it. I know that the back side of this model or the dorsal side of this model is where I see the spinous process. Based on that terminology, I can name my three gray horns. Now, I know that I, I heard this discussion too, the difference between just calling it a dorsal horn or a dorsal gray horn, it's exactly the same thing. So let me put in parentheses here, gray horn. Gray horn is more specific, it gives you the color, but the only kind of, of matter in the spinal cord arranged as a horn is the gray matter. So there's no horns in the white matter. A, a horn and a gray horn are the same thing. So they're, they're synonyms for each other. When I'm looking at my three horns that I have over here labeled with, with arrows, when I look at uh, this particular horn right here, when I'm looking at this horn, which of those three, dorsal, lateral, or ventral, is this one right here? Yeah, so Gloria is voting correctly. This one is called the dorsal horn, the dorsal gray horn. I'll put in parentheses. This is the one that's closest to the back side of the spinal cord that makes it the dorsal horn. This is the one up here that's closest to the front side of the spinal cord. What's the one that's closest to the front side of the spinal cord called? Yeah, exactly. The one that's closest to the front is the ventral horn or the ventral gray horn. And then here on the outside, the one that's farthest from the middle, sticking out toward the outside, this is the one that's called the lateral horn, the lateral horn. Now, when we're, we're looking at the three horns of the spinal cord, 
the types of neurons that live in each of these places are, are actually different neurons. So let's start here with our, our two horns that are closer to the front side of the spinal cord. Let's start with this one right here, the ventral gray horn. The ventral gray horn is where we find something that are called somatic motor neurons. Remove that. Somatic motor neurons. These are the types of motor neurons that control all of the skeletal muscles in your body. So if I'm trying to send a direction or message out to help you contract the muscles in your arms to take notes, the neuron that makes that happen is the neuron that lives up here in the ventral gray horn, lives here in the front. Let's say I'm not trying to send a message to um, contract a muscle in my arm. Let's say I want to send a message to contract the muscles in my stomach because I just ate something. That's going to be the job of the motor neurons that live here in the lateral gray horn. So when we talk about the lateral gray horn, this has something called visceral motor neurons. Visceral motor neurons means this is the type of neurons that controls smooth muscle or cardiac muscle. Visceral means organs. So the lateral gray horn is where I find the motor neurons that control your organs, your smooth muscle and your cardiac muscle. So the lateral gray horn on the side has motor neurons to control organs. The ventral gray horn has motor neurons that control your skeletal muscle. My dorsal horn here in the back doesn't actually have motor neurons. I don't know, has, has anyone happened to have a chance yet to, to study this? Do we happen to know what kind of neurons live in the dorsal gray horn? It's okay if we don't, I was just curious. The type of neurons that live in the dorsal gray horn are interneurons, interneurons. And we've talked about interneurons a little bit in lab before and in lecture. If you were to describe what an interneuron does, what are some of the, the ways you might describe what an interneuron does? What's its function? Yeah, so Monica's using the word predictions. Yep, it makes predictions for us. We predict what we should be doing. So whether my organs should be responding, whether my skeletal muscles should be responding. Yeah, and, and the way that I make those predictions is by processing information. Absolutely. Remember, here's a, a word that I know we've used at some point. At some point, we talked about how interneurons do what's called integration. Integration, where we take the sensory information we've collected and predict what the right response would be. So my, my processing neurons, my integrating neurons, live here in the dorsal gray horn. My two types of motor neurons live here in my either my lateral gray horn or my ventral gray horn. What's the one type of, what functional classification of neurons have we not mentioned? We said interneurons, we said motor neurons. Who's missing? Yeah, those sensory neurons, right? So here is a note that I want you to write down for yourself to make sure that you know this. Sensory neurons don't live in the spinal cord. I'll say it again. Sensory neurons don't live in the spinal cord. Sensory neurons actually live out here. So this little thing out here, I didn't ask you to label it, but it is something that we definitely have to know on the model, and we just must know this with the spinal cord in general. This is called a dorsal root 
ganglion. Dorsal root ganglion. The dorsal root ganglion is the place where sensory neurons live. Sensory neurons live out here. So the way it works when you're trying to, to do the process of, of responding to something, sensory information comes here through those sensory neurons. They give that information to the interneurons that live here in the dorsal gray horn. And this, the interneurons that live here in the dorsal gray horn decide which type of motor neurons should respond. Whichever type is activated is going to leave the spinal cord and go out so that it can send information to the body. So here's what we've said so far. We've said that there are three types or three places with gray matter in the spinal cord. They're named with those words that describe their locations. So dorsal, lateral, and ventral. They each have different kinds of neurons in them. And those sensory neurons don't live in the spinal cord. They just bring information there. Before I move to the next picture, what questions do we have, if any, at this moment? Or give me a thumbs up to help me know you're tracking with me. I got one thumbs up. Okay. Here, I'm going to give you a penguin. Ooh, we got a unicorn. I like that. Also, I just love the hedgehog, so we got to have a hedgehog too. Um, so Gloria in particular is saying um, that's the part that confuses you. What, what in particular are you saying is the part that confuses you? I guess I would say because this is the back, uh -huh. and dorsal means back, but this uh -huh. is like up front. Uh, well, so it, it's in front of the spinal cord, but see how there's kind of two parts to it? It's part of the back half of what comes off the spinal cord. Okay. So I, I would say when you're thinking about the terms back and front, Mm -hmm. um, think of it less relative to the spinal cord. Think about it for each structure uh, in general. So, so if I'm pointing to a structure right here, compared yeah. to a structure right here, I can compare front to back that way. If I'm talking about a structure right here, compared to a structure right here, I can compare these front to back. When I am talking about these two parts right here, I would compare these front to back compared to each other. So I'm not specifically comparing it relative to the spinal cord. Uh, you you would kind of, it's kind of the comparison apples to apples, oranges to oranges, right? If I'm trying to name this one, I'm not gonna compare it to the spinal cord. I'm gonna compare it to something that's, that's most closely related to it. So uh, these two would be what I'd compare for dorsal versus ventral. Okay, that makes more sense. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and we'll we'll talk some more because we're going to do the roots and the, and the rami. We will talk some more about that too. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, Karina made a good point about that's actually a good tie into our next picture here. I think, yep, so our next picture here talks about what are called roots and what are called rami. I see your question, Nicole. I will answer that in just a moment. When we're looking at, at the spinal cord, the spinal cord is hiding. Actually, here, I'll answer it right now. The spinal cord is hiding in the middle of the vertebrae in this big space right here called the vertebral foramen. The vertebral foramen. So here, let me draw you a circle. This whole space here that has the spinal cord inside of it, and it has uh, some adipose tissue inside of it, that space is called the vertebral foramen. Just remind me in the chat, what did we say that word foramen meant? What did that word foramen mean? Yep, foramen always means a hole. So the vertebral foramen 
is the really big hole that we have in every single vertebrae. The function of the vertebral foramen is to be a home for the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is stuck inside the vertebral foramen, but I need to send and receive messages outside of the spinal cord. To help me do that, I'm going to use spinal nerves. So spinal nerves are what can leave the spinal cord and go out to the body to get stuff done. To build a spinal nerve, I need what are called roots. So when you're, you're trying to think of the difference between roots and, a, and rami or a ramus, think about how roots of a tree are where a tree starts, where it's growing underground. The roots of a spinal nerve are the places where it's attached to the spinal cord so that I can build a spinal nerve. So each spinal nerve, which is what I'm seeing kind of right here is a spinal nerve, is made of two roots. I have a root that attaches to the back side of the spinal cord and a root that attaches to the front side of the spinal cord. Since this is the one on the back side of the spinal cord, what would I call this one on the back side of the spinal cord? What's my word for? toward the back. Yeah, exactly. The one toward the back is called the dorsal root. The dorsal root toward the back side. The one that's toward the front then is going to be called ventral root. Ventral means toward the front side. So here's the ventral root on the front side. Here's the dorsal root on the back side. Hey, remember on the last slide, when I told you that this bump right here was called the dorsal root ganglion. Let me draw a line and label it again. The dorsal root ganglion, Oops, spelled it wrong, use your notes. <laughs> the dorsal root ganglion is a bump, a large spot on the dorsal root. This is the place where the cell bodies or the thinking part of my sensory neurons live. So they got a little bump back here. But then those sensory neurons have to get into the spinal cord somehow to share their information. That's the job of the dorsal root. It goes into the dorsal side or the back side of the spinal cord. Then it's going to talk to interneurons in the, the dorsal horn. The interneurons figure out how we should respond either by activating a neuron in the lateral horn or the ventral horn. Whichever one of these kinds of motor neurons is activated, I send that motor information out this ventral root. So the ventral root comes out the front side where I've got motor directions to go control something in the body. So the dorsal root has sensory information. The ventral root has motor information. Where the dorsal root and the ventral root fuse with each other, so kind of out this direction, this is where I have a spinal nerve. Now, if you remember from last week when we were talking about our cranial nerves, we said how some of them just do sensory information, some of them just do motor information, some of them do sensory and motor stuff. When we talk about the way that spinal nerves work, spinal nerves always have sensory and motor. So spinal nerves are always made from a dorsal root that has sensory information and a ventral root that has motor information. They come together to form a spinal nerve. Now that spinal nerve with sensory and motor information doesn't stay together for very long. Pretty much as soon as I form a spinal nerve, so I switch sides on you now. As soon as I form a spinal nerve, I'm actually going to start breaking it into smaller pieces to send information or receive information different ways. So I've got a little branch right here. That's literally what this word ramus means. It literally means branch, like a branch on a tree. I've got a ramus right here that's pointing toward the backside of the body, what would I call 
this branch right here if it's going toward the back side of the body. Yeah, Christina's right. Always, every time in this lesson, when we're talking about toward the back side, it's always dorsal. This is my dorsal ramus. It goes toward the back side of the body, which means my other arrow is pointing toward the ventral ramus. Ventral meaning toward the front. It's going toward the anterior side of the body. Now, later in our lesson, we're going to mention things that are called a plexus. A plexus is where multiple spinal nerves share neurons with each other. They mix it all up into a big spaghetti noodle mess to form the big nerves in your body. When various rami, ventral rami, share neurons with each other, that's how I form a plexus. So this part right here, when you're looking at the, the describing the functions of it, it mentions that a ventral ramus helps us to form plexuses, meaning this neuron or this branch right here is gonna share neurons with, with its neighbors that are up higher or down lower. This one right here, the dorsal ramus that goes toward the back side of the body, the dorsal ramus is going to be the one that collects information from your back or sends information to those muscles that we're learning today. So big ideas from this labeling. The roots of a spinal nerve are what are attached to the spinal cord. The rami of a spinal nerve are the branches that it makes after it's come together. And this bump right here is a absolutely must know, underline highlight star must know the dorsal root ganglion. And I spelled it wrong over here, but the dorsal root ganglion. That's, that's our must know structure because that's where my sensory neurons live. That's their, their cell body before they send that information into the spinal cord. So we've talked roots, we talked rami, Let's use dorsal and ventral. Yes, yeah, Gloria, they are on both sides. All of these structures, I just had you label them on one side, but they're on both sides. So uh, keep that in mind. You can label it on either side. I don't care. <laughs> Let's uh, use dorsal and ventral one more time to describe the, the indentations that we find in the spinal cord. Remember that when we were talking about um, the brain, we talked about how the brain has bumps called gyri and indentations called sulci. And we said that the left and the right half of the brain are divided with the longitudinal fissure. These words that you see here are the same words that we use in the brain. So you're not learning new words for, for indentations. We're seeing them again in a different way. We have what's called the dorsal median sulcus and the ventral median fissure. Both of these have the word median in them, by the way. Median just means we're in the middle. So a sulcus or a fissure, both of these are indentations. Which one of these, dorsal, or ventral is going to be the one right here. What would this one be? Dorsal or ventral? Yeah, this one's going to be my ventral one, right? So my ventral median fissure, ventral median fissure. Ventral means I'm on the front side. Median means I'm in the middle. Fissure. Means I'm an indentation. See, I've got this indentation inside here, which means on the back side, my smaller indentation that I see up here is called the dorsal median sulcus. Dorsal median sulcus. When you are looking at the functions of these two structures, these two indentations, their job is basically to divide the left side and the right side of the, the white matter that's found in the spinal cord. We talked about how the gray matter of the spinal cord is called thorns. 
the white matter of the spinal cord, we've got a funky word for it here in lab. The funky word mat, uh, for it in lab is called funiculi. Funiculi. In lecture, I'm, uh, I'm going to have you use the word tracks because it's actually English. <laughs> uh, but my technical anatomy word for what we call the white matter in the spinal cord is we call it funiculi. That's just a, a way of saying I've got groups of neurons that all travel together. Either they go up the spinal cord together or they go down the spinal cord together. They're arranged in what are called funiculi. Or like I said, in lecture next, next unit, we're gonna call them tracks. So white matter tracks, the groups of white matter in the spinal cord are divided in the back by the dorsal median sulcus and in the front, by the ventral median fissure, two dividing lines. So by process of elimination, we know that this little dot right here is called what? What's this thing here in the middle? Yep, the central canal, the central canal. Hey, who happens to know what's inside the central canal? Yeah, Karina is actually right. The central canal is a place in the very middle of the spinal cord where I find cerebrospinal fluid. So the central canal is actually connected to uh, the ventricles in the brain. At the very bottom of the fourth ventricle, if you look at it and see where it goes down through a tube, it actually goes into or connects to the central canal. So this is the cerebrospinal fluid tube, uh, fluid filled tube here in the middle of the spinal cord. There's cerebrospinal fluid in the middle of the spinal cord. There's also cerebrospinal fluid outside of the spinal cord. The cerebrospinal fluid that's outside of the spinal cord is found in the same space or the same area as it was found in the brain. What was the name of, of the place outside of the brain where there was cerebrospinal fluid? Does anyone happen to remember? Yeah, Nicole's right. It's a big long one. The subarachnoid space was the place where I found cerebrospinal fluid outside of the spinal cord. And I actually find it at, or outside of the brain, excuse me. It's the same place that I find it outside of the spinal cord too. So if we're making a, a comparison, how things in the brain are similar and how they're different, a central canal, central canal in the middle of the spinal cord is kind of like those ventricles in the middle of the brain. The subarachnoid space is exactly the same between the spinal cord and the brain. So speaking of the subarachnoid space, that brings us to the last thing that we labeled on our model here. Subarachnoid space. Sub means I'm underneath something. Based on its name, the subarachnoid space, what am I underneath? The subarachnoid space. Yeah, Christina's right. The subarachnoid space is underneath the arachnoid motor. Was the arachnoid motor superficial, intermediate, or deep? Which of those words did we use to describe the arachnoid motor? Yeah, the arachnoid motor is the intermediate or the middle meningeal layer. If you notice here, I've got this white layer with the little stringies pointing down from it. All those little stringies are the spider webs that we find giving it its name. It's little collagen fibers that come off of the arachnoid motor, making it look like a spider web. So my intermediate meningeal layer the arachnoid motor, 
right here. What was the name of the thick layer that was most superficial? What's this outermost layer called? Thick one on the outside. Now the very outermost layer, the thickest layer around the brain or the spinal cord is called the dura mater. And the thinnest layer, one that's directly attached to the spinal cord and directly attached to the brain, is called the pia mater. So the pia mater closest to and attached to the spinal cord, just like it's attached to the brain. The dura mater, uh, the thickest outermost layer that that's here on the outside of the spinal cord, also on the outside of the brain, and then that arachnoid mater there in the middle. Here's a, a lecture teaser for you. If someone is having their cerebrospinal fluid tested to see if they have what's called meningitis, which is when these meningi layers get inflamed and they put pressure on the brain and the spinal cord, what we'll actually do is insert a needle into this subarachnoid space around the spinal cord to collect some fluid from there. So you'll learn more about some, uh, something called a spinal tap. That's what it's called when we take out cerebrospinal fluid. That comes from this subarachnoid space underneath the arachnoid mater, which is that intermediate layer of the meninges. These are all the things that you labeled with your groups. Let me um, pull up the model that you have on page four. Were there any other structures from this model that you wanted me to help you label or did we hit, oh, I'll just put it there. Are there any other structures you'd like me to help you find? Or give me a thumbs up. Okay, so dura mater and, and pia mater on here? Certainly. Uh, okay, so let me get my, well, I'll, I'll do my pointer and I'll let you guys label it. Uh, pia mater should be the easiest for us to find. Remind me uh, in the chat, where is the pia mater located? Can you describe for me? How would I find the pia mater? Where is that one supposed to be? Yes, yeah, the deepest one, right? So it's going to be the one that's going to be attached directly to the spinal cord. So see this white layer right here? That's all along, it traces all along the outside of the spinal cord. That white layer is the pia mater. So I guess it looks like it's labeled number 24, pia mater, right here. Number nine right here is the most superficial layer or the thickest layer here on the outside. What was that thickest layer called? Yeah, so, so number nine out here on the outside, that's the dura mater, number nine. Number 12 is the last meningeal layer. This is the layer that looks like spider webs. So number 12 is my arachnoid mater. And remember I told you if we're doing a spinal tap, we're going to pull out cerebral spinal fluid from the subarachnoid space. Write that out, subarachnoid space. It's not one you have to label, but I, I'm mentioning it to say that you can see number 13. See right here all this gray space right here? That's the subarachnoid space. So subarachnoid space, which means that right above it, number 12, or over here, it's maybe kind of labeled number 11. All of that is the arachnoid mater and then the dura mater right on the outside of that. Any others on here that we had questions about or do we feel, feel good about it? Yeah, good work, Christina. 
just real quick, um, let me, can I get my pointer out and point? At, um, if we're talking about the ramus, then this would be the dorsal ramus and this would be the ventral ramus? Correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah, because this one's angling back toward the back side, this one's angling toward the front. So, yep, that's correct. Okay, thank you. And here's that thing. Remember, I, I mentioned that dorsal root ganglion. Gotta, gotta know this guy right here. It's also over here as well. So, like we were, we were having that that moment of realization in the chat. We do have them on both sides. So, I, I can see my my enlargement right here. I can see my enlargement right here. Both of those are my dorsal root ganglion. So we labeled this model. Um, yeah, so I think that's where I'm going. You'll have to, when I pull up some new pictures, Nicole, you have to tell me if, if that's where we're, where I was thinking. Um, we labeled all the stuff on a model that shows the spinal cord inside of vertebrae. When you see this model, remember that the bifid spinous process shows me where the backside is. This part right here, we didn't ask you to label it on here, but this is called the vertebral body. I'll label that because you have to know it when you're learning bone markings. This is the vertebral body. The, the big bony part, the body of the vertebrae is always on the front. The spinous process is always on the back. We like this model because we have the bone to reference to. Most of my spinal cord models do not include the bone. So when we're looking at a spinal cord model like this one, we have to get a little bit more creative or maybe pay a little bit closer attention to figure out the front side from the back side. The single most important structure to help you determine front side or back side is this thing right here, dorsal root ganglion. And hey, I'll give you an abbreviation for it so that later in, in class today when I ask you about it, you can just tell me DRG, dorsal root ganglion. The dorsal root ganglion was a bump on the back side of, of the spinal cord, remember, of the root. Here's my dorsal root ganglion on this side and my dorsal root ganglion on this side. Yeah, Tierney is absolutely right. It's labeled number 24 on this model here. So the dorsal root ganglion is the bump on the back side, on that dorsal root, the big bump. The first thing you should be looking for when you sit down to any of these other spinal cord models that don't have the vertebrae around them, the first thing you're looking for is this bump, the dorsal root ganglion. So I can see it right here on this model. I can see it right here on this model. I know it's a little bit not super clear for you, but this is a cell body. That's this big red the dot right here. This neuron, let me draw it for you. I know it's hard to see. This neuron looks like this. Does anyone remember from our neuron discussion, this neuron has one extension coming off of its cell body? Yeah, here's where that unipolar word comes back. So the neuron that's found back here, the sensory neuron, is a unipolar neuron. So the reason I have a ganglion, the reason I have a bump back here is because this is where the cell body is found. This is where the, the head, if you will, of the neuron is found. So the dorsal root ganglion is right here, which tells me then that this is the dorsal horn, that this is the ventral horn. Here's my, my weird looking lateral horn out here. So that dorsal root ganglion, first thing we look for on every model, one last model, use your pencil up here. Let's find our dorsal root ganglia. Can we circle our two dorsal root ganglia? Grab that pencil. I want us to do some awesome coloring. There we go. 
got a lot of blue going on. That wasn't the default color. I would say we're all feeling pretty down, right? <laughs> That's perfect though. Yep, my, my dorsal root ganglia. There we go, we got some green. <laughs> It's the bumps that I find on the back side of both of, of these, these roots here. Remember, this is the dorsal root and the ventral root is in front of it. They come together to form the spinal nerve. Yeah, so just where I was getting, Jacqueline, is, is the spinal nerve is the places. So here, I'll, I'll clear this off. The spinal nerve is where my dorsal root and my ventral root meet. So here's some spinal nerve right here. Here's some spinal nerve right here, down a little bit lower, because I've got another dorsal root and another ventral root. Up here, we've got a dorsal root and a ventral root coming together to make the spinal nerve and the spinal nerve. So a spinal nerve is just where those two roots fuse together. Any other questions about these pictures? Okay, well, what I want to switch to is um, this model here. Can you tell me what page we've moved to? Okay, so Christina says we're now on page six. Page six. I'm going to use this model to show you where some of the big picture spinal cord structures are, even more than just the things that, that we're labeling here. We will talk about these things that, that we're labeling, uh, but we will also talk about some other structures as well. When I look at the spinal cord, the spinal cord starts where the medulla oblongata ends. So then we become the spinal cord. It goes all the way down. The spinal cord itself doesn't actually get to the bottom of your vertebral column. The spinal cord itself ends at about the level of the L1 or L2 vertebra. So here, this terminology um, in, in the guided lessons, and we'll talk about it here in class today. When I say L1 or L2, what I mean is lumbar vertebra number one or number two. Sometimes I will talk to you about T12, for example, what lum or when I say T12, it's not lumbar anymore. T12, what would that T stand for? Yeah, T means thoracic, thoracic. So when I say T12, I mean thoracic vertebra number 12. Uh, just wanted to clarify that terminology for you. I could talk about C5. Um, so sometimes we just abbreviate and just give the first letter. Thoracic, totally spelled lumbar wrong. Sorry, guys. But L for lumbar, C for cervical. When I look at, at my spinal cord here, it ends around L1 or L2. So the end of your spinal cord is not all the way at the bottom of the spinal column. It's here around L1 or L2. Now, in this region, I know it's a little hard to see, so I'm going to try to draw it on here. There's a structure around L1 or L2. This is something called the conus medullaris. Conus medullaris. That's the cone-shaped end of the spinal cord. So the spinal cord itself ends at L1 or L2. Then, extending down in the middle of the vertebral column, we have all of these groups of nerves that together are called the cauda equina. Cauda equina. So all of these nerves that make up, it's, it literally means the horse's tail, cauda equina. All of these little nerves that keep going through the spinal column, those nerves are called the cauda equina. It's a little hard to see. On, on our models, uh, but I'll mention, and you might even have to add it for yourself to see it clearly, 
there's a little piece of connective tissue that goes from the conus medullaris all the way down to the end of the vertebral column. That little thing is something called the phylum terminal. Phylum terminal. It's a little connective tissue line that helps to anchor the conus medullaris in place. So think about it kind of like a strap that holds this steady. Because the spinal cord doesn't reach the very bottom of the spinal column, we use a piece of connective tissue to help it stay in place. So the phylum terminal, connective tissue, surrounded by all of those nerves called the cauda equina. The cauda equina nerves are the things that come off of this cone-shaped end of the spinal cord right here, called conus medullaris. The spinal cord has a few places where it's a little bit larger than normal. So one of the places where it's larger than normal, we can kind of see it right here, where it gets a little bit wider, and we can kind of see it right here, where it's a little bit wider. These are things that are called the enlargements. So the top one, unsurprisingly, is called the cervical enlargement. And the one down a little bit lower is called the lumbar enlargement. These enlargements are places where the spinal cord gets a little bit wider because a bunch of nerves branch off of the spinal cord there. When I look up here at the cervical enlargement, where does it look like these nerves that are leaving it, where are they going into? What part of the body do these nerves go to? Yeah, they're, they're going to form something called the brachial plexus. They're, they're going to end up down inside the arms. So the reason I have this, this cervical enlargement where my spinal cord is a little bit larger in the cervical region is because this is where the nerves from my arms branch off. And down here, my spinal cord gets a little bit larger to get us ready for this cauda equina where all of these nerves go down into the, where are these nerves going? Can we tell? Promise it's not a trick question. <laughs> yeah, Nicole's right. My, my lumbar enlargement, my, my conus medullaris, those are places where the nerves branch off that are going down into the legs. So lumbar enlargement is where nerves for the legs come from. Cervical enlargement, where nerves for the arms come from. I think that's all of the big picture structures on the spinal cord that I wanted to mention. I'm going to clear things off and we're going to start talking about these things. When I look at the spinal cord, I have four plexuses. When you see this word plexus, I want you to think of a place where nerves are sharing their neurons with each other. So the goal of a plexus, the reason plexuses are good for your body, is because if I damage one of my spinal nerves that comes off of the spinal cord, I might still be able to send or receive information from parts of my body because this spinal nerve sending and receiving information that also comes through this one and that might also come through this one or this one. Um, think about it, there, there's a word called redundant where there's, there's more than one thing that does the same thing. That's what's going on with the plexus. More than one spinal nerve sends or receives messages uh, for each of these parts of the body. That's why I have a plexus. The names of these plexuses are regional terms. So it's it's not a trick question when we think about where these different plexuses are found. It, it's just those regional terms that we talked about. So let's do some brackets and see if we can name them. Here is one plexus right here. Here is one plexus right here. See how my nerves are, are kind of weaving together and, and forming big things? I've got one plexus up here. I'm actually going to move that one out a little bit. And I've got one more plexus right here. From my list of plexuses, 
which of those plexuses do you think is the one at the very top? What plexus is my top bracket all the way up there? Yeah, exactly. My, my top plexus up at the very top is what's called the cervical plexus. It's in the cervical region. My nerves that I make from the cervical plexus are going to go up into the face. They're going to go into the neck. So my cervical plexus takes care of stuff kind of in this region. Next, we have this, this plexus. It's going to help me to take care of the arms. It's going to make those big nerves that take care of the arms. Which of my plexuses would this one be right here? Yeah, absolutely right. This plexus up here is called the brachial plexus, the brachial plexus. All of the major nerves that go down into your arm come from or they start from the brachial plexus. I have two plexuses down here in the lower back. Would it be lumbar or sacral? That's up a little bit higher. That's my my higher one. Yeah, so remember that the lumbar region was the the lower part of your back. And then we had the, I don't know how to make that easier to see. Sorry. Um, we had the sacral region that was down around the sacrum. So the sacral plexus is the one that's down lowest. The sacral plexus, by the way, the way you're going to recognize this one is it makes this huge nerve right here. This huge nerve that I see down here in the bottom. That huge nerve is called the sciatic nerve, and that is the largest and longest nerve in the body. That's how textbooks will describe it. So we'll label this on, on my next slides because you can see it a little bit better, but this big nerve that I see right here, that comes off of the sacral plexus. The lumbar plexus is in the lower back. It, it also makes some, some uh, nerves that go into the leg, but not that really huge one. And then the brachial plexus makes stuff for the arms, the cervical plexus up here in the neck. You need to learn some particular nerves. I'm going to move that again. Some specific spinal nerves on, on this model here. And this is an example of a time where I do think that uh, visible body is going to help you. I would encourage you to use, I think it's called like the nervous system, practice activity in there. Use that to help you start locating these nerves in 3D too. We'll label them here on our model, but uh, you also have to find them 3D in visible body. So let's start with uh, this nerve up here called the axillary nerve. Where did we say the axillary region was in the body? Yeah, so the axillary region is, is the armpit region, right? So the axillary nerve is a nerve that travels through the armpit region and stays up top in the upper arm. The axillary nerve is what I see right here. This nerve that wraps around your humerus that travels through the armpit region here in the back, this is the axillary nerve. I'll type its label here. Now, one of the activities that we're asking you to do with, um, with these spinal nerves is rather than memorizing what exactly they do, we want you to predict what they do. So here's how we would do this. This axillary nerve lives up here in the shoulder. Does anyone remember, what's the name of the muscle that lives here in the top of the shoulder? Yeah, exactly. The deltoid muscle lives up here in, in, the, in the shoulder. The axillary nerve controls the deltoid muscle. If you know where the axillary nerve lives, if you know what muscles live by it, you can predict its action. So the axillary nerve takes care of the deltoid muscle here in, in the top part of the shoulder. And when we're talking about where the axillary nerve collects sensory information from, the axillary nerve collects sensory information from the shoulder as well, because that's where it's found. So up here in the top, the first one we're labeling up here is called the axillary nerve. We see it passing through the armpit region and then wrapping around that humerus here in the front. We have 
three nerves that are down here in the forearm that are important for us to know. Check it out. Radial, ulnar, and median. All three of those, radial, ulnar, and median, are found down here in the forearm. Not a trick question, I promise. When I point to the one in the very middle, who do we think this middle one is? Not a trick question, I promise. Yeah, exactly. The one in the middle is the median nerve. Median nerve. Okay. Now we have to look at figuring out which bone we're seeing on these two sides to help me out with radial versus ulnar. Here's my pinky. I got a little chopped off here, but here's my pinky. Here's my, uh, my thumb. Which bone is on the thumb side? Who's on the thumb side? Yeah, this is the radius side, right? So this little nerve here, right next to the radius, is called the radial nerve. I'm gonna draw a line for that one. Radial nerve, right next to the radius. So the ulnar nerve is gonna be the one that's next to the ulna. Now I want to point out, we're not gonna be tricky and ask you about them on, on this hand over here. But this hand has flipped over and now the thumb is on this side and the pinky is on this side. Since the thumb is over here, which nerve am I seeing right here? If the thumb is over here. Yeah, so, so if we were being tricky, which we won't be that tricky on you, but if we were being tricky, let me add my, my lines. Technically on this other side, we are seeing the radial nerve because it's on the thumb side and the ulnar nerve here on the pinky side. Radial and ulnar are found next to the radius and the ulna, the median found in the very middle. The last one we have left is called the musculocutaneous nerve. And the musculocutaneous nerve is this one right here, musculocutaneous. The musculocutaneous nerve is found in the arm region. The median, radial, and ulnar nerves are all down here in the forearm region. So major nerves, all of these were the major nerves of the brachial plexus. Make sure we can identify each of these. Then we transition into the major nerves of the lumbar and sacral plexuses. So this is a mix of both of those plexuses. Does anyone remember which nerve did I say this really big one was? Who's the really big nerve? Yeah, so the really big nerve that I can see kind of on both sides here, that's the sciatic nerve, sciatic nerve. And if you've ever heard of someone with sciatica, or if you've ever had sciatica, that's when this really big nerve gets angry. So it's the biggest and the longest nerve that we have in the body. When that really big nerve gets angry, it's, it's pretty painful. Anyone who's had that, I had that with pregnancy, with both of my pregnancies, <laughs> not fun, uh, sciatica. When we're looking in uh, the thigh region, the other one, I really just got to move that line a little bit better. There we go. Um, th there's one other nerve in this thigh region that I want to point out here in the middle. This one here in the middle is what we call the obturator nerves. So let's circle them. Obturator nerves. These two right here. The obturator nerves. Hey, does anyone happen to remember from studying the leg muscles, there is a group of muscles that lives right here in the middle thigh. It's a group of muscles that's named based on its movements. Yeah, exactly. This area in the very middle, the medial thigh, is where we find the muscles called the adductor muscles. The obturator nerve controls the adductor muscles that live here in, in the interior thigh, the medial thigh. So if we were to damage the obturator nerve, 
we would have trouble making the adductors do their job. So the adductors here in the middle, hey, the sciatic nerve is on the back side of the leg. Do we remember the name of some of the leg muscles that I'd find on the back side of the leg? What muscles live up here in the back? Okay, yep, so one of them, semitendinosus, absolutely. Any others we can think of? Who's next door to semitendinosus? Remember? Oh, it's fine, Christina. It's hard to spell. How about biceps femoris? That'd be another one on the back side. Um, by semitendinosus, there's also semimembranosus. So some of those muscles that live on the back side of the leg are going to be controlled by the sciatic nerve, that one there. The femoral nerve, and I, I've kind of messed up the way that I did that here. We're going to take off our labels for the sciatic because you guys can find that one. The femoral nerve runs down and parallels the femur. So here I'm going to kind of draw a little bit of it for you or put a box around it. The femoral nerve right there, and you can see the femoral nerve over on the other side. So the femoral nerve travels kind of in front of the femur, the femoral nerve by the femur. So when we're talking about muscles like rectus femoris, that lives here in the very middle of the front of the leg. Uh, muscles like vastus, lateralis, or medialis on the front side of the leg, those are going to be controlled by the femoral nerve because it's found there on the front side. When we look down here into the leg, uh, the last thing for us to, to label are our fibular and tibial nerves. So the fibular and, and tibial nerves, when I'm looking at those ones, it, it's a branch. We're, we're basically comparing front side versus back side. So when we're looking at um, the one here that's hugging the tibia on the back, the one that hugs the tibia on the back is the tibial nerve. And the one that here we're seeing toward the, oops, my pencil back, we're seeing toward the front side is the fibular nerve. We're seeing it toward the front. It's kind of on the front right next to the fibula. So the fibular nerve more toward the front side, the tibial nerve more toward the back side. I guess technically here, let me label it the way that, that we're learning it, the common fibular nerve. I mean, common means it branches. Uh, so common fibular nerve, just like the, um, the fibular nerve. In our terminology. What questions do we have right now that we can think of? Can we see them on the other leg? Uh, we can. It's it's a little bit dicier. Um, here, let me clear. I'm going to clear everything off just so that we can see that other leg a little bit better. On this other leg, the tibial nerve is right there. So let me put the name. Oops, spelled it wrong. Remember that the tibia is, is the medial bone. So the tibial nerve, I can see it kind of here, parallel to the back side. The fibular nerve is going to be over here on this outside. So the fibular here on the outside toward the front, the tibial nerve a little bit deeper, uh, more toward the back side by the tibia. So let's draw our line here. So I'll mention for you as we get ready to move on, uh, there are some great pictures in the guided lesson to help you with uh, making predictions about um, where we get sensory information or where we send motor information for each of these nerves. Check out those pictures in, in the guided lesson. Um, I, I see your question. 
which one in particular it's kind of tough to we'd have to zoom in really close I'm thinking I'm gonna draw one it, it's kind of like the the largest one so there's there's a really thin fine one next to it the there's one that's a little bit bigger that's this particular one that I think it would be that being said, I'm not going to ask you which of these lines it is. If I flag it on this side, I'm just going to flag one on this side. I'm going to flag it over here. I think we're more likely to flag it on, on this one over here. So use those pictures from the guided lesson to help you out with figuring out sensory and motor functions of these nerves. Again, like we've been talking about in, in our groups with, with people, uh, there's a lot to learn, and I don't think you should memorize these, these functions. You can. Um, the packet has for you listed where we're, we're learning our motor functions, so specific muscles, and it also has listed for you the uh, potential places where we're collecting sensory information. 100% you can predict this as long as you know where your nerves are. So make sure you learn where those nerves are located. That make sure you learn where your muscles are located. If you know those two things, I promise you, you can make these predictions. But the guided lesson has some good pictures to help with that as well. I know I had some requests for muscle movements. Let me make sure we talk about muscle movements and then we can see how much time we have left to decide where else we want to go. When we talk about the muscles of the back, uh, where the muscles of the back are, where we're focusing their movements on is what they do to the upper arm. So in particular, we're talking about movements of the humerus. When I move the humerus, that's going to move the entire arm because the humerus is the most proximal bone in the arm. So there are two major movements that we're wanting you to learn this week when we're thinking about um, what the humerus does. The first thing that we're thinking about that the humerus does is flexion and extension. The second thing that we'll talk about here in a moment is abduction and adduction. When we think about flexing your humerus, think about when you, we actually can see both of these movements here when you think about going bowling. So when you pick up a bowling ball and you swing it toward the back, um, when your, your whole arm goes backwards, we're extending. When we release it toward the front, we are flexing. So remember that flexion means we're, we're making angle smaller at a joint. So in the case of, of um, the shoulder joint, you're moving your arm forward. When we're extending the shoulder joint, that means we're moving our arm backwards. When you're predicting whether we flex or extend, it should be a little bit obvious for you. If you're a muscle that lives on the back side of the humerus, if that's where you attach, you're going to pull the humerus toward the back. Movement toward the back side of the body, that's extension. If you live on the front side, or to some extent, if you live kind of on the lateral side of the humerus, you're going to flex the humerus. You're going to pull it toward the front when you contract. So let's look at our list of muscles here. There are four muscles that, that we want you to predict. Some of these we've already learned. A couple of them are new. When we talk about the deltoid muscle, which of these words, anterior, lateral, or posterior? Which of those words might you use to describe where the deltoids found? Yeah, Gloria is totally right. The best word to describe the deltoid is lateral. The deltoid is on the lateral side of the humerus. That's where that little point of the triangle deltoid is attached. Since the deltoid is attached to the lateral side of the humerus, the deltoid helps to flex it. It's found on the lateral side. So my deltoid flexes the humerus. I know we've studied pectoralis major. What word would we use to describe the location of pectoralis major? Yep, pectoralis.
pectoralis major is an anterior muscle. So anterior muscles also flex. Lateral flexes, anterior flexes. Do we have any idea um, of what where latissimus dorsi is found? That's one of our new muscles this week. Yeah, this is a muscle on the back, absolutely. So latissimus dorsi, I guess we could, look, hey, check this out, guys. Dorsi, what word does that look like that we used all over the place at the beginning of our class? Exactly, dorsal. I totally legit just made that connection with you guys here in class. So Dr. Aulis learned something new today or realized something new today. Latissimus dorsi is a, a big muscle kind of in your lower back region. So it attaches to the back side of the humerus, which means it's gonna do flexion or extension. Attached to the back. Now I'm gonna do extension. Latissimus dorsi does extension. Teres major is a small muscle, it's a new muscle for us this week. Teres major is on the back side, it's attached to the scapula. Teres major is also gonna help with extension because it's attached to the back side of the humerus. So when you are learning, and again, I want you to memorize the rules, not the specific examples. When you're memorizing flexion and extension for the humerus, remember, if I attach on the front side or the outside, the lateral side, I'm gonna do flexion. If I attach on the back side, I'm gonna do extension. Learn those rules and then use what you know about the locations of muscles on the homework assignment or on the exam to predict the answer. Here's the other movements for us to know. Abduction and adduction. When we talk about abduction, this is when, uh, so I know somebody had asked for examples of some of our movements. There's a really great one for abduction. If you've ever sat down in that machine, they might call it, uh, well, I don't know what it's called because it's not a shoulder press, um, but it's when you put the, the pads next to your shoulder and then you kind of flap your arms out. Um, that's what's going on with abduction. Abduction is, is the example I gave you guys when, it, when an alien comes and abducts me and my arms go up. So abduction at the shoulder joint, adduction is when we bring it back down. If you live on the front or you live on the outside and you contract, that's going to lead to abduction. That's gonna pull the arm up. If you attach on the back side of the humerus, you're gonna pull the arm back down. So again, we have our same set of muscles here. So when we talk about the deltoid, remember that we said the deltoid lives on the lateral side of the humerus. That means the deltoid's gonna help with abduction. Latissimus dorsi was on the back side of the body. That's going to adduct. Pectoralis major on the front side helps with abduction. And teres major helps with adduction. Checking to make sure I did my muscles. Are these the right muscles for our predictions? I should have proofread. Yeah, they are. Perfect. Okay. So with predicting our actions, that brings you to our favorite activity here at the end. I say that sarcastically, right? Because I know it's not our favorite. But again, I want to remind you, being able to use origins and insertions to predict actions is something that you will have to do on the exam. I'm gonna not give you names of muscles. I'm gonna give you origins and insertions and ask you to predict what's gonna happen. So let's do this activity together to help us with our predictions. So we're talking about the muscle latissimus dorsi. Oh, here, let me show you latissimus dorsi before we dive in. Latissimus dorsi is this muscle right here. So if you've ever um, seen the machine that's called a lat pull down, when you're, you're pulling something down with your arms, latissimus dorsi, that's this big muscle right here. 
Who can tell me the name of this one right here? Do we know the name of this one? Big one in the upper back. My hint is it's shaped like a trapezoid. Yeah, Christina's right. This big one up here is trapezius. So your big back muscles, trapezius up higher, latissimus dorsi down a little bit lower. So we're going to work on figuring out what latissimus dorsi does here. So I'm going to start by labeling, um, they call it the trap muscles at the gym. Yeah, so short for trapezius, trap muscles, absolutely. We're going to start with the origins of latissimus dorsi. It's been a while since we talked about this. When a muscle contracts, the origins do or do not move when a muscle contracts. Yeah, the origins do not move. So the first thing I'm labeling for my latissimus dorsi muscle is I'm labeling the places where it attaches where the muscles are not moving. Yeah, the place that that insertion is going to move toward. So we're talking about the spines or the spinous processes of T6 through L5. So I'm totally just going to guess. You can just guess to where T6 is. T6 to L5. L, by the way, here's that terminology I mentioned, right? T6 and L5. What did T stand for again? What was T? Yeah, T is thoracic. So thoracic in the chest region. And then L5, L was that, yeah, that, that lumbar region, right? L5. So this muscle attaches from the middle of the thoracic vertebrae, number six, all the way down through number five of the lumbar vertebrae. And it attaches on the iliac crest. Remember that the iliac crest was that thing that you can put your hands on. So the iliac crest, when you put your hands on your hips, that's what you're touching. So here's my iliac crest. Here's the spinous processes of those vertebrae that I see here. These are my origins, my places that don't move. Now we're going to go to the insertions, the places that do move. Everyone's favorite bone marking, right? Intertubercular sulcus. Inter, in between. Does anyone happen to remember what this tubercular part means? It's a super weird word. I'll draw about where it is for us right here. That tubercular word, let me switch out a green, means a tubercle, tubercle. Ooh, I think I spelled that wrong. Um, the tubercle was a bump. Remember that we had a greater tubercle and a lesser tubercle up here at the top of the, the humerus. This is my insertion point. My insertion point and my origins, then we're going to do a little connect the dots, right? We're going to connect things together. So what happens when this muscle contracts is this part of my bone is pulled toward this part of my bone. So my insertion point up here is lateral to my origin point right here, which means that when this muscle contracts, when this origin, or excuse me, when this insertion moves toward this origin, I'm going toward my body's midline. So consider this, when, when this part goes toward this part, it's going to, in a way, roll my shoulder or rotate my shoulder, pull my shoulder, toward the middle of my body. The first thing that this muscle does is it, it moves the humerus toward the midline of the body. The 
second thing we're trying to figure out is whether it makes the angle at the, the shoulder joint bigger or smaller. This is when you think about swinging your arms back and forth. So this is where I gave you the bowling ball analogy, right? So when my arm swings forward with that bowling ball to release it, that would be decreasing, uh, decreasing the angle because we're going from a wide angle to a small angle, we're pulling it forward. Increasing the angle is when we pull it backwards. These are fancy words for extension or flexion. Extension or flexion, when we increase or decrease our, ang our angles at those joints. When I move this insertion toward this origin, I'm doing the process of extension. I'm pulling my arm, my whole arm's gonna move with it, backwards, the process of extension. So the angle at that joint is gonna get bigger. I'm gonna pull it farther behind where it started. The two movements of latissimus dorsi, the muscle that goes from the spine and the hips up to the shoulder, we're going to pull your arm backwards as if you're pulling that bowling ball back to release it. And we're also going to do adduction where it pulls that arm back down next to you. I've talked a lot. I need you to help me out in the chat. What are we thinking? What questions do we have? Go for it, Christina. Um, back to page 14 where we were talking about movements. Um, mm -hmm. I think there might be a typo in the packet because you were saying that the Taurus major abducts, abducts the humerus, but it says on the packet that muscles attached to anterior oh, and posterior yep. side. So abducts. I apologize. The, the packet is actually correct. My slideshow is incorrect. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, so uh, I will... Are there any questions on this slide before I leave it? Because my markings are going to go away. Because I'll go back and we'll fix that together. Thank you for mentioning that for me, Christina. No problem. No problem. So here, let me show you all what, what Christina, I'm sure you all already found it, but let me show you what she was, was mentioning. And that was, yep, that was a typo error. That was a copy and paste error. Gonna be going to be real here. When we're talking about adduction, the only types of muscles that can do abduction are muscles that live on the lateral side. If you live on the front or you live on the back, you always adduct. You always pull it to the middle. So that was, I apologize, a copy and paste error there. Uh, if we attach on the outside, the lateral side, we're going to pull the bone up. If we attach on the front side or we attach on the back side, when I pull on you, that's going to pull you back to the middle. So your packet's correct. Study your packet, not my copy and paste <laughs> error there. So really the only abductor we're learning this semester is latissimus dorsi. Or just, I, I'm just, my copy's done. It's not helping me anymore. <laughs> I circled the right thing and said the wrong thing. Apologies. The only abductor we're learning is the deltoid muscle. The deltoid muscle does abduction. Everybody else on your list is, is doing adduction, pulling things back together. So Terry's major is, is on, on the back side. It attaches on the back side of the humerus, not on the lateral side of the humerus. Because it attaches on the back side, it's going to do adduction. So here, let's pull up our muscle man here. Our only muscle that, that is attaching here on the lateral side of the arm is um, my deltoid muscle right here. When we talk about latissimus, that's gonna attach here, uh, uh, it's on the back side of the body. Um, I'm going to mix up my Terry's here, I believe, and we'll have to fact check me here. Um, 
I believe this is Terry's, but I need to fact check that. Oh, did I say the word adductor, Gloria? I, 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 I just may completely, <laughs> I just might be done for the morning. I apologize. The only abductor, make sure I say that correctly. The only abductor, abductor, the only one that works for the aliens is the deltoid. Everybody else is adductor, adductor. So my infraspinatus muscle, infraspinatus below something called the spinous process on um, the scapula, that's going to be an adductor. Latissimus dorsi, adductor. Aries and trapezius, all of them here on the back side, those are all going to be adductors. Only my deltoid can do abduction. Everybody else can't. I'm really sorry guys. <laughs> it is it is definitely Monday. <laughs> we are about out of time. Are there any other particular things that we wanted to chat about before we called it a day? scanning through our pictures. We've hit a lot of, of the major things. I mentioned it at, at the beginning of class today. If you have particular questions, if there's things that you want to work through with me, I have office hours today from 5 to 6.30 and tomorrow from 11.30 to 1.00. So feel free to pop in if there's particular things that you want to work on with me or if you want to powwow with a group of friends and say, hey, let's all come together. I'm totally willing to, to work with you all in, in those times. So um, feel free to stop by tonight with questions, tomorrow with questions. On Wednesday, we're going to pick up, start working on lesson number 11 for lecture. So this is all the structured lab stuff I had planned for this week. Um, but feel free, like I said, to stop by during office hours if, if you have questions.